Need to get started, but get all those slides we're going to get through. Yep. Okay. Morning, everyone. Welcome to the second last history research seminar for semester two and for 2024, which is terrifying thought. Um, just as we get started this morning, I would like to acknowledge that we're meeting today here on the unceded land of the Ghana people and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, it's a great pleasure this morning to welcome our colleague, Professor Rufus Ranava, um, who I'm sure very many of you in the room and online are familiar with today. Um, I to just I, I, to preface what I'm about to say, we are recording this morning's session, so I just wanted to kind of make that clear to everybody who's here and online. Um, just to give you the heads up on that, Andrikos would like it recorded to be able to share with some people in Cyprus. So Andrikos is Professor in British Imperial and Colonial Histories here at Flinders, um, and is, and also an, an Honorary Professor in History at De, uh, De Montfort University in Leicester, UK. He's authored four monographs, and his latest one, um, Assassination in Colonial Cyprus in 1934 and the Origins of Eorca, um, was first published in 2001, but has, sorry, 2021, but has just had a Greek translation appear this year, which is fantastic. Um, he's translate, he's edited or co-edited 16 collections, most recently Popular Culture and its Relationship to Conflict in the UK and Australia Since the Great War, published by Rutledge in 2023. He's published over 60 articles, articles or chapters with a couple that have recently come out in Australian Historical Studies and European Review of History this year. He's got a book and an edited volume in, um, not quite in press, but forthcoming with Brill, articles in press with the Journal of Interdisciplinary History, the Griffith Law Review, and the Social History of Medicine. Um, and as some of you will be aware, um, as of next year, Andrikos will be um, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History, which is a major Q1 journal. There's a couple of other Flinders colleagues working with Andrikos on that, so it's a really fantastic achievement. And um, we're obviously wishing you all the best with the editorship of that journal, Andrikos. Thanks, James. So, um, welcome, Andrikos. Uh, this morning, Andrikos will be speaking to us about the cigarette industry, smoking and anti-smoking in colonial and post-colonial Cyprus, 1920s to 1980. Thanks, Thanks James. So Thanks, guys. Um, <clears throat> to the next one. Okay. I won't be reading too much, but I'll, I might just start with a little bit of reading. After several years of trying, in December 1971, Halop Kehayan, a prominent Cypriot of Armenian descent, he couldn't tell by the name, along with nine other prominent Cypriots, formally registered the Cyprus Anti-Cancer Society. The society said little in public in its early years about the links between cigarette smoking and lung cancer, until in September of 1977, Kehayan chaired a meeting which established the Committee for the Campaign Against Smoking. This then finally led to the first publicity of the committee in February of 79 and the formation of the Non-Smokers League, note the name Non-Smokers League, and the first law discouraging, or the first anti-smoking laws in 1980. Cyprus was late to establish an anti-cancer society, as other similar Commonwealth and neighbouring states had established theirs many years in, and in some cases decades earlier. Italy in 27, Turkey in 47, Sri Lanka in 48, India 51, Israel 52, Jamaica in 55, Greece 58, Malaysia 66, Nigeria 68. Why was Cyprus so late to establish one and why did it take almost a decade after? for an anti-smoking league to appear. Okay, so this is the announcement uh, in April of 72. This is Kahian here. All right, so what I wanna do is 
is fill a gap. There's nothing on Cyprus in connection with this broad subject, as you will see. Um, we do have an article in Press with Social History of Medicine. Apparently, there's a DIY and everything, um, but I'm the second author, so I'm not getting those emails. But um, yeah, it will be. It compares Cyprus and Sri Lanka, but that's quite a sort of different thing. This now goes much deeper into what happened in Cyprus. Uh, there's very little literature generally, actually, on the Middle East. There's a book on Egypt by Reli uh, Shekta, which is a really good book on Egypt. Uh, looking at it, there are some similarities with Cyprus, but a lot of differences. Uh, as we will see in Cyprus, for example, the thing that they smoked really that they wanted was Virginia cigarettes. Um, Egypt, they're still quite prom prominently interested in Turkish style cigarettes or Arabic style cigarettes. Uh, the, the other thing is, as we will see in Egypt, um, British American tobacco, which I'll be talking about a lot today, otherwise bat. Um, came to establish uh, one sort of monopoly in Egypt alongside a local company. Um, but in Cyprus, what we see is a duopoly between two international multinational companies, one being BAT and the other one, Carreras Rothmans, which we will talk about. Now, personal connections to all of this. Well, my dad was a smoker from 12, 13 years of age as soon as he left high school before he came to Australia. Um, the other uh, part of it is that I knew from my mother's stories that her first cousin, who I'm going to mention later, Pavlagis Pavlu, worked as a, she thought she, he, he represented one of the companies. Uh, she wasn't sure which one, but she remembered the, the word Craven A, which was a famous and the most popular cigarette in Cyprus, at least, but also worldwide, is very popular. As it turns out, he's a little bit part of the story. Uh, not a lot, not a lot, but a little bit. Uh, he was a member of EOKA, he was an area commander, and later he became a right-wing politician for getting into hotels, as you do in Cyprus. The real sort of uh, connect, or the real origins of this was discussions or predating us getting this grant, the linkage grant that I had with Tom Kehoe about the role of Cyprus and in big tobacco. Um, now, when I offered to do this paper, I thought, oh, one article, we'll try and keep it to 10,000, which I knew would be impossible. At the end of all of this, I've got 24,000 words. So I've decided to split it between the colonial period and the post-colonial period. The post-colonial period is the much more interesting period. Um, and to acknowledge it's the first time that I'm sort of able to actually do research on this period because the newspapers, although had been digitized, there had been um, a, a limit on years, on, of 70 years, and they were releasing them every month. Uh, so you can work out that 70 years, if it was still there, we wouldn't be able to do this research. Uh, but this year, they opened them. Somebody just flicked the switch and magically they were all available. Uh, so really fascinating research, apart from the fact that almost every newspaper that I, you come across has Makarios on it, right? Uh, his picture somewhere or other. Um, still very interesting research uh, able to be done. Now, some basic cigarette smoking is a 20th century phenomenon. The mechanization of rolling of cigarettes starts in the 1880s in the United States. This, of course, means that it becomes industrial in scale at, uh, very quickly. It replaces things like pipe smoking or, or water pipe smoking or, or whatever other type. Um, in the late 19th century, they were known as death nails. So they know that there's something wrong with them, right? Now, the links to cancer, well, the first uh, research, I believe the Nazis may have done some research into it, but leaving that aside, in 1950, UK researchers, William Dole and Austin Hill, linked lung cancer with uh, cigarette smoking. 
1953 in the UK, warnings began to appear about the dangers of cigarette smoking. In 1954, US researchers Hammond and Horn confirmed the UK study. Governments began to accept the science behind it. However, they their, their arguments were, it's up to the individuals to, to stop or to deal with it. That was Australia's position, actually, even into the early 1960s, even after the 1962 Royal College of Physicians in the UK linked cigarette smoking to the rising deaths due to lung cancer. Now, in Cyprus, Cyprus is at the higher end of smoking rates in the world, even today. There are no statistics until 1989. I did have an explanation as to why that is, but then I took it out. You can ask me in questions. In 1989, they did a random sample of 4,422 households and found that almost 24% of people were cigarette smokers. Uh, of those, almost 42% were men and 7% were women. So it's a very masculine thing. In 1997, we have the first time that we can have stats for the cause of death recorded. Mind-blowing, right? We have no statistics before 1997. Now, in that year, they found 63 deaths caused by lung cancer. In 2021, it was 326. The population, well, you can see the difference is about five times, a little bit more than five times. The population had not increased five times. Uh, it went from about 580,000 in 1990 to 900, just over 900,000 in 2021. So it's a very significant increase during that period. It's not even the period that we're looking at today. Uh, in 2012, the EU reported, a re EU report found that 30% of Cypriots in the Republic regularly smoked cigarettes, higher than the EU average of 28%. I should say that does not include the Turkish Cypriots. In 2019, Cypriots ranked sixth from 27 for almost for most daily smokers and fourth in the EU for heavy smokers, uh, which I think is classified as 20 plus cigarettes a day. Now, the Turkish Cypriots have a higher rate of smoking. Uh, the stats are not exactly uh, ideal, but indicating that overall, potentially, if we take it all together, Cyprus has around 35%, which is close to the estimate of the World Health Organization, which is 33%. And just to put it in context, Australia is 10%. So you, what am I going to try and do today? Well, we can't, cannot understand the timing and strength of anti-smoking measures or legislation unless one understands prevalence of smoking, the role of cigarette imports and manufacturers or manufacturing, uh, and including multinational big tobacco companies. Um, so there's a whole, th there's different things that we need to sort of look at, but I'm not going to look at everything. Um, we have tobacco cultivation going on in Cyprus. It's up and down until the 19, until 1940, when it steadily increases. Most of the tobacco cultivated in Cyprus was exported. The Cypriots did not like the tobacco grown in Cyprus, right? They wanted Virginian tobacco. However, so big companies would buy up, okay? Uh, Importing the leaf. So there were cigarette manufacturers in Cyprus. We're going to talk about some of them. Um, they used a little bit of the local leaf, but they mainly imported what they called the Macedonian leaf from uh, Greece, northern Greece, and they used that. However, there was also a lot of importing of cigarettes. That's important because they wanted to smoke Virginian cigarettes. Uh, and this came under con the control of the cigarette manufacturers, eventually, as we will see, and big tobacco companies. Uh, and cigarette manufacturing, well, as I said, there were numerous local factories from 1960. Um, there were two left, sort of giving away the story. But anyway, they merged with big tobacco. One merged with British American Tobacco, Ardat, which was a subsidiary of that and the other one with Carreras Rothmans uh, in the 1960s. So in the first decade of Cypriot independence, we have the establishment of a duopoly. 
uh, over the industry. None of the other companies survived, cigarette manufacturers. So going to the first part, uh, which we'll look at the British colonial period, I'm going to try to establish what the industry was like, uh, a little bit about the cultivation, but more about importing and manufacturing, and then a, a little bit about the prevalence of smoking, given the lack of statistics here. Um, it's uh, you'll see how I've managed to cobble that together. And finally, were there any anti-smoking messages? After all, the studies have been published from 1950. So let's go a little bit back. 1864, we have the first cigarette factory in Larnaca, established by Constantine Dianellos and Yorgos Baroni from Thessaly, Greece. My, that's another interesting comparison with Egypt. Most of the people involved in cigarette manufacturing in Egypt were either Greeks or Armenians. In 1881, the Anelos built a second factory in Nicosia. That's where it got a bit more confusing for me. One was called the Anelos Larnaga. One was called, as we will see, the Anelos Vergopoulos in Nicosia. So it became very confusing even for me. Next, we have AG Batiki factory starting up in Limassol in 1888. For some reason, I can't find anything about the origins of Batiki, where he came from. I'm guessing he's from Greece, but I could be wrong. But he becomes, this becomes very important, even though I know the least about the, that factory historically. In 1905, the Anello split the factories, one in Larnaga, one in Nicosia. The one in Nicosia becomes the Anelos and Virgopoulos. From 1920, this is when there is an uptake in tobacco cultivation in Cyprus. And cigarette manufacturing and cigarette imports, they all begin to expand and thrive. Now, what they cultivated in Cyprus, just to clarify, was called locally yellow leaf. It's basically a Turkish uh, style of tobacco leaf. But what I found was that there's all sorts of names. There's Oriental, there's Balkan, there's Greek, there's often it's just referred to as Turkish or Oriental. That was the one that they mainly grew. And then the other one, Cyprian Lata Latakia, is a Syrian variety, which is used in blends and especially in pipe blends. It has a very low nicotine content, the lowest of any tobacco leaf. Now, in 1922, Melik Melikian, yes, an Armenian uh, uh, Cypriot, uh, in Nicosia, started importing Carreras of London, UK company, cigarettes. Uh, it was a major company which, which had just introduced, notice the time, one year earlier, Craven A, which just becomes the most popular cigarette in many places. Um, by the way, this talk will have a lot of ads later, which I love watch, looking at ads from the period. Then in 1927, so basically Malikian Maliki, becomes the rep of Carreras, you know, importing. In 27, BAT, which had, BAT was a, had itself come together in 1902 from Imperial Tobacco Company and an American one to form BAT, so massive, right, from 1902. Then it um, bought, in, bought Ardath, which was another London company, and made it a subsidiary in 1925. So they operated separately, but it, was, it took it over, so to speak. Now, it built a warehouse in Nicosia. This, at this point, is to use for uh, importing. Also, when they're buying tobacco in Cyprus, to store it there. PM Tseriotis uh, imp became its, you know, whatever rep, importing the BATR that cigarettes, which included Players, State Express, different ones from uh, State Express Triple Five or State Express Triple Three. In 35, the Supreme government gave, uh, tried to increase cultivation by giving a monopoly to a company called Cyprus Tobacco Company on the purchase of cultivated tobacco, and they produced cigarettes known as Giprinos. I'll pass these around. They're not as interesting as I thought they would be, but anyway. Now, this, this monopoly was a huge failure. 
I'm not going to go into the story, and they ended in 1940. What's important for us, however, is that in 1940, Rothmans took over the interest of the Cyprus Tobacco Company. And basically, this meant purchasing tobacco from Cyprus and for a while continued to make Kiprinos cigarettes, which they marketed to the, in the UK. They were trying to uh, uh, tap into the interest there, interestingly, on, Tur uh, on Turkish tobacco styles. And, you know, here's a British colony that... Now, World War II, we have uh, some changes occurring. There's limited shipping for obvious reasons. We see a reduction in the importation of the foreign cigarettes and also of the leaf that they preferred to use to make cigarettes in Cyprus. The government, the, one of the rare interventions, creates a standard cigarette, which they would sell cheaply. They, they controlled the whole thing. And they, in, they had all of the manufacturers in Cyprus agree to put 50% of Cypriot tobacco into these cigarettes and force them to produce 75% of their production of these cigarettes. So what this did was it, it began to change people's uh, tastes and the the because the, these local cigarettes uh, had the local leaf in it now. They also invested in an expert who came from Mauritius, Jeffrey Corbett, to improve the yellow leaf in particular. In 1947, there were still seven cigarette manufacturers. Of these, the Anelos in Larnaca, the Anelos and Vergopoulos in Nicosia, A.G. Batiki, who now had two factories, one in Limassol, one in Nicosia. These were the mechanized ones. The others were still rolling by hand. Then, big change. In 1951, B.A.T. Ardat, I'm calling it, builds a factory in Nicosia to make cigarettes in Cyprus. Despite the fact that there's seven, or whatever, six probably by then, cigarette factories. Seriotis, who was importing their cigarettes, becomes the managing director of this new company, Ardath Cyprus Limited. One of, oh, here it is. Is the, their light, one of their lighters. Ardath Cyprus Limited. Okay. So they're making now BAT and Ardath brands of cigarettes in Cyprus. They're also importing the ones that they don't make. Then, between 1955 and 59, we have the Cyprus emergency, um, where, you know, we, we've spoken about another context with EOCA and all of uh, the issues of trying to unite Cyprus to Greece. Anyway, Ardath and the, the Batiki factory were attacked and damaged in fires, most likely by uh, TMT, which was the Turkish Cypriot group formed to counter EOKA. EOKA itself made a lot of declarations banning people from smoking foreign cigarettes. So, so imports of foreign cigarettes becomes less and less. By the way, they had a way of, people had a way of getting around this, even if they were Eorka people. You can probably imagine what they did. They would get a packet of Greek or Cypriot cigarettes and fill it with foreign cigarettes. Um, then in 1959, Geranis and Petridis, who had just joined the board of Dagis Batigi, started importing Rothmans and Dunhill. Dunhill was connected to Rothmans uh, through Rembrandt Group. Carreras and Rothmans had merged. We're talking now internationally now. They had merged in 1958. Although they were, sister, they were still sister companies, they still existed separately, as you will see, until 1972. We'll come to that later. However, they, they are working together. So Melikian is importing Carreras, um, and, and Garanus and Petridis are importing Rothmans. And now they've all come together on the board of Dagis Batigi cigarette manufacturing. 
So this is 1959 after the Cyprus emergency, which ended in February, let's say. And then after this, or after the ending of the emergency, foreign Virginian cigarettes again begin to flood the market. Okay, the prevalence of smoking during colonial rule. Well, in 1930, we have a report on rural life in Cyprus by Brewster Surridge, which claimed that 51% of Greek and Turkish Cypriot adult males smoked, and, and I quote, very few people smoke in moderation. In 1949, it was estimated that 50,000 pounds of cigarettes were consumed in Cyprus per month, most of that English cigarettes. In 1955, the Anellos, which was the fourth largest manufacturer, who seemingly disappears by the end of this decade, sold 150,000 packets of cigarettes in 1955. So one can only imagine that the others who were larger than this company uh, would so sell sold more. Cigarette smoking was central to Cypriot culture, especially masculine culture. Every newspaper had an ad for cigarettes, right, that I looked at. Even when I was looking for something else, I would still see the ads there. Now, cigarette manufacturers and importers offered prizes to smokers. For example, um, Ardath offered a Volkswagen in 1956. That's a pretty good prize, right, to take up smoking, to enter this. I mean, and it, what's weird is that it happened, I think, just after the factory had been burned. Fair figure. They sponsored community and sporting events, especially football, right? Ardath sponsored the soccer club Omonia, which is still there. It's a left-wing club. And Batiki sponsored Apuel, the right-wing club. I don't know what happened there. It was, uh, but that, that relates to what I found really bizarre. You know how you cel not celebrate, celebrate the life of somebody after they've died at the wake? Well, I found references in newspapers donating cigarettes to the people going to the wakes. You figure, you work it out. But if, guys, if you want to join the person we're celebrating, here you go, have a cigarette. Here are some ads. We're going to go through these quickly. The points that I want to make here are, you can see how basic these ads are in the 1930s. They're basically like images. They're just words and not particularly sophisticated, mainly just announcements. Here we can see the relationship between Dagi Batigi and Apoel goes back to the 30s. Okay. TV is the Anelos Vergopoulos. In the late 50s, uh, the newspapers uh, ran stories about these companies. So on the left, we have Ardath. On the right, we have the Anelos and Vergopoulos. There was other ones about the Anelos, which was, we know it was still there, but somehow disappears uh, from independence. Anti-smoking messages. Basically, the newspapers uh, just reporting um, certain uh, foreign news. So there's limited reporting on medical research that links cigarettes to lung cancer and action taken by other governments, including the UK. Greek language newspapers report on the House of Commons debate in which the Minister of Health accepted the medical advice of a link between cigarettes and lung cancer, citing the significant increase in deaths caused by lung cancer from 1940 to 49, and that would and that he would create a medical committee to report. In 52, there was another article that uh, about doctors that um, believed that smoking 25 plus cigarettes a day would increase the risk of lung cancer. And then in 1954, there was a report on a press conference where Ian McLeod, who was the UK health minister, accepted the medical committee report confirming the link. Uh, meanwhile, during that press conference, which ran for 45 minutes, you can imagine what Ian McLeod was doing. Three cigarettes in that time. Um, the article mentions this, which is funny. And then the subtitle, however, of this article is Tobacco Companies Assert No Proof. So this we need to keep in mind all the time. And one of my arguments is that they double down, they increase their efforts uh, from 1950, as we will see. Already we see one year after the medical report, the first medical report linking can lung cancer with cigarette smoking, they build a factory in Nicosia to make cigarettes. Now we're going to move to the Republican period, which I think is the more interesting period. In 1960, we have independence. Between 63 and 74, we have an on and off again civil war. We have separate 
Turkish Cypriot enclaves being created. And then in 1974, we have the Greek coup and the Turkish invasion. All of this is ha in happening uh, while um, I'm going to talk about the, the industry. From 1961, international multinational tobacco companies partner with local companies to form a duopoly over the cigarette manufacturing and importing. The rates of smoking remain very high. And in the 1970s, we see the coverage of anti-smoking messages growing, but remains limited. It's not until 1980 that we actually begin to see articles in newspapers that talk about Cyprus itself and smoking. All of the rest are just referring to news from overseas. The first partnership, Dagi Batiki and Carreras. In March 1961, Batiki announced a merger with Carreras and that they would now make Cravenay cigarettes in Cyprus not just for local, but for export too. This was approved by President Makarios and Vice President Dr. Faisal Kuchuk, whom, by the way, were, I would call, borderline chain smokers, okay? You never saw Makarios smoking in public for reasons of the fact that he was an archbishop. However, if you can find a photo of Faisal Kuchuk with, without a cigarette in his hand, you've done, it's very hard to find one. Either a cigarette or coffee. He has to have one or the other. Now, Garanis and Petridis are behind this merger. Melikian becomes the local distributor. Local resources here combined with the technical knowledge, research facilities, and access to world markets provided by Carreras. Now, Carreras had entered into these similar partnerships in Ireland, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, Canada, Rhodesia, Malta, Jamaica, and Fiji. Notice they are all linked to the British Empire. Now, in 67, it was renamed Garanis and Petridis Limited, so the Batiki name left. In 1968, Carreras created the company Carreras of, of Cyprus Limited. Uh, its director was Alan Dover. The board uh, included Garanis, Malikian, and my mother's first cousin, Pavlakis Pavlu. Now, the financial year ending in 1968, Carreras of London as an entire, you know, company announced a 47% profit increase from the previous year, attributed to its international expansion. And now also they're beginning to make other Carreras brands and uh, Dunhill brands in Cyprus. Dunhill, remembers connected to Rothmans. We're going to come to that in three minutes. In the 1970s, Craven A remains the number one cigarette sold in Cyprus. So this is a photo uh, uh, of the Dagi Batiki factory in Nicosia. It's a different factory to the one that they originally built. The one that they originally built, I don't have a photo of it. It's on the Turkish side. I don't know if the building still exists. This is on the Greek Cypriot side. I'm 100 percent. I've driven past this 100 times, very close to the university that I worked in between that one and another university. Would have driven it past it this year, too. I don't know if the sign is up still, but. Now. The next one. Bat Ardas merges with Vianellos and Verbopoulos. So in 1961, to counter the move by Carreras, BAT Ardat announced they're going to increase production, more brands are going to be made in Cyprus. In October of 63, they announced a merger between Ardat Tobacco Company Cyprus Limited and the Anelos and Virgopoulos, which, has, which was the oldest company, right, dating back to whatever I said, 1864, I think. Basically, what happened was Ardat was liquidated. However, the Ardath Managing Director, C.B. Osborne, became the Managing Director of the Anello San Vergopoulos. BAT basically took over the Anello San Vergopoulos, but kept on the president, added the Ardath Managing Director, and then brought it into its family, basically. It controlled almost 90% of its shares. Both factories continued to function and making the brands that they made. The Anelos and Vergopoulos have also expanded to import the popular Greek cigarettes made by Babastratos, who had been imported by a, a small-time importer before. Rothmans. June, in, June of 69, Sidney Rothman, chair of Rothman Limited, and his son announced at the luncheon at the Hilton Hotel in Nicosia that Rothmans would now be made 
at the Garani St. Petridis factory. The factory would now not only make Craven A, but also Rothman's King Size Filtered, two of the most popular cigarettes in the world, as well as all the Dunhill brands and so forth. In 1970, they created Rothman's of Cyprus Limited. The managing director was none other than the managing director of Carreras of Cyprus Limited, Alan Dover. Also in 1970, they announced a, a new cigarette, which would be made for the first time in Cyprus, called Royals. I really want to say Royals, because that's how I people say it in Cyprus. Royals, which was a lighter tasting and cheaper cigarette. I'm not sure. I, I, I know this cigarette was in Australia. I don't know if it was imported from Cyprus to Australia or whether they subsequently made it in Australia or both. The move saw Carreras Rothmans now, because they are sister companies, capture 65% of the separate cigarette market by mid-1971. Within six months of appearing in January 1970, Royals had captured 6% of the market. Now, in 1972, internationally speaking, Carreras and Rothmans um, became one company. Okay? What's interesting is that in Cyprus, they remained as, I don't know for how long, but they remained as two companies after this. Now, the prevalence of smoking during the Republican period. Well, there's no official data, as I said at the beginning. What, what I've got is production and sales announcements, which doesn't uh, necessarily tell us about uh, the prevalence of smoking, uh, but it definitely tells us about what they're smoking, the, the choices they're making. Now, in the early 1970s, one million Cravenet was smoked every day. That seems like a lot. Right, for a country that's maybe half a million in population. Uh, Rothman's king size, seven million smoked a month. So you can see how popular Craven A is. Massively popular. The next most popular were Dunhill King Size and then Royals. In 1978, 7.5 million pounds of cigarettes were manufactured in Cyprus. Five million of that were was exported. Still. 2.5 million pounds, that's 210,000 pounds a month, were consumed in Cyprus. Unless some of it, I don't know, escaped in the black market, you know what I mean? Which was also, uh, which we haven't gone into. There's a lot of advertising and promotion and sponsorship of social and cultural events. And that's what I'm going to get on to next. So first, a bit of advertising. You can sort of see here chronologically how this evolves. Uh, this looks a little bit uh, in the older style, right? You can see the um, uh, Carreras black cat, which doesn't appear later on. You can see the use of Cyprus in the second, the middle ad. And then it's really like promoting Craven A as the best in the world. And more here again. The world comes up a lot. Again, a bit of history over there. Um, and in the one in the middle is Craven A uh, Sportsman of the Year competition, which is quite interesting because it was jointly won by a Greek and a Turkish Cypriot before the Civil War started, which I thought was cool. Um, here we have Carreras. Um, is it this one? No. But you can see here the different uh, announcements that they make about um, price changes uh, and the different brands that they're, they're either making these brands or importing them. The Anelos and Vergopoulos. This one's interesting because I worked out after a while, I wasn't paying attention actually to them very closely, but then I worked out that sometimes the prices go down, which is like nothing goes down in price. Except maybe fruit or vegetables, but you know, so it's interesting. Rothmans, Royals, um, another ad here for Rothmans, and here you can see Rothmans of Paul Mall, Cyprus, uh, continuing on as well. And you can see how much cheaper the Royals were to Royals. Here it's not very clear photo, unfortunately. But here we have President Makarios visiting the Craven A Pavilion at the Cyprus 11th International Fair uh, in 1965. So uh, the International Fair is still happens every year. Uh, 
and they obviously had a stall it, just for crepe and eight um, in, in the 60s. Now, in social and cultural life, uh, all the companies sponsored various events, especially sporting clubs, prizes. In February of 63, Carreras announced the Carreras Scholarship Scheme to fund scholarships at the Nicosia Technical Institute. Carreras launched the Keep My Village Clean competition with 500 pounds to the winning village uh, in 67. In 69, Carreras sponsored Cypriots to study engineering in UK universities. And in the 1970s, Rothmans just takes it to a whole new level, okay? We have the Rothmans Beautiful Cyprus Photographic Competition, the Rothmans International Cartographic Exhibition, Rothmans Combined Services Parachute Championships, Rothmans Air Show, Rothmans Bridge Championships, Rothmans Open Tennis Tournament, okay? This one they hoped would become big because they were sponsoring the Rothmans London International, which was won by none other than people like Rod Lieber and Bjorn Borg. Uh, it didn't quite happen, but they did manage to do something just as big. And I'm going to come to that. So here are some of their competitions and sponsorships. They went all out, right, with the photographic competition. I looked up Professor Arthur Frick, who was judging it. He was a professor at Beirut, at the American University of Beirut, which I thought was interesting. They didn't just pick anybody and bring him over from, you know, Limassol. Here is the open tennis tournament the air display, and then we have the Rothmans Rally. From 1970, Rothman sponsored numerous rally races during different seasons in Cyprus. You know, through the winter, summer, spring, there were like th three or four of these races. Then in October 1970, Roth Rothman sponsored a national rally, which attracted the International Automobile Federation, which gave the race international status as the first Rothman Cyprus International Rally was held in October of 71. It's been held every year since, except for 1974-75 owing to the war, and of course, owing to COVID in 2022. In 1982, it was promoted to the top level in Europe, uh, one of eight elite races, and in the year 2000, it became one of the World Rally Championship races from 2000 to 2006, and once again in 2009. So it isn't now one of the world uh, rally championships, but still, I think it's a big deal. They even had a great ad, right, uh, of the guy uh, driving around this on the TV. Not that many people would have had a TV back then in Cyprus, but anyway, he's driving around, and at the end of his driving around the bends and whatever, he's given a Royals to enjoy, right? You can imagine. Um, and you can see here that ad for the race as well. This was a big, big deal. A lot of coin fell here both in terms of putting it up and in terms of uh, tourism and for businesses. Here's some more from the 70s and 80s. But you, you notice Rothmans everywhere in the advertising. Anti-smoking messages now. In the 1960s, anti-smoking messages in the press increased marginally, mostly from foreign press and mostly reporting on international developments. Just going to go through this quickly. In '62, we had the Royal College of Physicians report. This is this this is reported on in the newspapers in Cyprus. The Greek language newspapers first begin to talk about it uh, in '64 to discuss the dangers of nicotine and how they could how people could cut back on their smoking. In '67, we have a U.S. report which is summarized in Greek press. There's no mention of government intervention, just urging smokers to try to quit. In the 70s, the press coverage increases, but no indication of local content or debate. So they're not discussing. It's, there's no dis debate happening. There's no discussion. In 71, there are discussions in the press around what other countries have reported and also what other countries have done to discourage smoking in the US, UK, Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. It even mentions that smoking in Italy was steadily increasing despite advertising restrictions from 62. Um, some, you know, um, there's a bit of conflict. It's like saying, well, if we introduce any uh, discouragement, it's not going to work anyway. From 72 to 74, more of the same discussion limiting the addiction. And then in 75, there's the WHO report urging governments to increase anti-smoking measures. Now, I come back full circle to Kehe Young. 
and the formation of the Cyprus Anti-Cancer Society and Non-Smokers League. In April of 72, Cahayan announced that Cy the Cyprus Anti-Cancer Society at a press conference at the Hilton, where they would announce also the mergers of the companies. The vice president was Stella Sulyoti, an ex-minister of justice and minister of health, and the treasurer was Dr. Reginos. He wasn't a medical doctor. Anyway, Reginos Teoharus, the ex-finance minister. I had, you know how long it took me to find out that he wasn't a medical doctor? The aim was to raise £100,000 to build a health facility. Until then, they would assist people in in-home care. Other aims were to facilitate medical research. Now, who was Kehian? Well, he was born in November of 22. His parents were Armenian refugees from Adana. Both parents died before he finished secondary school, and his mother died from cancer. So that was an important, that was important for him. He could not go abroad to university. Why should he go abroad to university? There were no universities in Cyprus until the 1980s, okay? So instead, he did what every other Cypriot dreams of doing. He got a government job. But then in, uh, what is it, 46, he started the General Services Agency, which was an import-export business representing U various UK companies. In 51, he moved into insurance. He became the general agent for Warden and Royal Insurance, both UK companies. And in 59, he became the local agent for Lombard NatWest Bank, which was later acquired by the Greek bank Alpha in 1998. He started Lombard Banking Cyprus and Lombard Cyprus Limited. He was known as Mr. Lombard by everybody. Probably easier to say than Kehian. In 1969, he was part of the delegation to the uh, International Labour Organization uh, conference. He, he was part of the Cypriot representation. In 1970, he was one of the founders of Universal Life Insurance, which included Lelos Tseriotis, who was the son of the guy who was, uh, you know, in the, with the, one of the companies, managing director. He had died by this point. And then in 1971, Kehian became the honorary consul for Brazil. He later became a property developer as well. So he's a prominent Cypriot, right? His wealth allows him to sponsor and donate various charities, sporting events, awards, prizes. He was even one of the sponsors of the Rothman Cyprus Rally. I mean, Cyprus is a small place, so I'll cut him some slack, right? Uh, given what he achieved. Uh, in 1990, he also was elected president of the Cyprus Heart Association. So it wasn't just the, you know, momentary interest here. Kahian was also a champion tennis player, which I found very interesting, and I went down a lot of rabbit holes here, and in 1960, and an administrator as well. In 1973, he announced the Cyprus Anti-Cancer Society had raised £20,000. In 1974, that the government had given uh, some land for them to build a care home, which I visited, uh, and also they started their, their primary fundraiser known as the Christodula March. In 77, he begins planning for the Anti-Smokers Society. In 1980, he steps aside as president of the Cyprus Anti-Cancer Society and becomes president of the Non-Smokers League. I have not sort of in my mind or found any evidence as to why this needed to happen, why they couldn't be, you know, do, you know one. I don't know. Now, his activity, what do they achieve? Yeah, this is the last one before the conclusion, I think. Uh, that's a photo of him uh, in one of his, uh, for his obituary. He died at uh, age 91. In 1980, we have the first press discussing the prevalence of smoking in Cyprus and studies, if you want to call them that, that were done in schools from 1971. The 1979 results found that 29% of 18-year-olds smoked. In 1981, they sponsored a cardiology seminar in Nicosia where they invited Dr. Edwin Besterman, who was at St. Mary's Hospital London, where he basically said, Cypriots, you eat too much, you smoke too much. There's an article. Um, in July 1980, the House of Representatives passed the first anti-smoking legislation. This is what Kehayan had been working behind the scenes for since 1977. The Law 58 of 1980, Health Protection Smoking Control Act. This banned the sale of cigarettes to minors under 18, liable to a fine of £100. Created the Tobacco Advertising Control Committee to advise the Minister on advertising, which was banned on television, cinema and radio, unless approved by the committee. Notice, no ban, 
in newspapers. No approval if the proposed advertisement could lead to the public impression that cigarette smoking led to professional success or induced non-smokers to take up the habit. Manufacturers and importers were also forced to label each packet of cigarettes with a warning about the harmful effects of cigarette smoking, liable to a £500 fine if you didn't. The label was clarified as, and I quote, warning by the health, sorry, warning by the Minister of Health, smoking may be harmful to your health. They banned smoking in public places, including government and private workplaces, liable to a £250 fine. They outlined specifications and lim limits on the content of tobacco, such as nicotine, that manufacturers had to adhere to. I think that's a £1,000 fine if they were found. Let's be clear. Nobody has ever been fined for any of this, ever. Now, the law... Oh, there's the article by Bestem and Cypriot Smoke and Eat Too Much, right? Um, the law was revised or amended throughout the 80s into the 90s. Then it was repealed in 2002 and replaced uh, because they were going to enter the EU with a new law. Uh, it, this, this had very little impact on, you know, it, it, if it had an impact, it was small on smokers. Is it an achievement? It's a massive achievement that Kehian uh, was able to uh, do. So in conclusion, the high levels of smoking, which we talked about at the beginning as uh, primarily, and the delay in forming the anti-cancer and anti-smoking societies was linked to the substantial cigarette industry controlled by multinational cigarette companies in partnership with local ones. These companies expanded their interest in Cyprus after the first medical studies linked cigarette smoking to lung cancer in the early 1950s. This evolved during the Republican period as a duopoly between Bat Ardath and Carreras Rothmans. There's marginal discussion in the press on the links between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Tahian led the change by first forming the Cyprus Anti-Cancer Society in 71, and then the Non-Smokers League in 1980. The latter was instrumental in the first anti-smoking legislation passed in 1980. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Oh, I will do that, yeah. Thanks very much for that, Andrikos. Very interesting. Um, great to have some show and tell too. We don't often get that in, in seminar presentations these days. So thank you. Um, I'll just... Stop the recording.